Hello, beautiful people, and welcome to another episode of The Infertile Diagnosis. Welcome back to another episode of The Infertile Diagnosis with me, Monica Cox. I hope you guys have had a beautiful Christmas. We're a few days out and now we're running up to the new year, which I hope 2020 is going to be the year that you take control, reconnect your fertility links, and achieve your ultimate goal of becoming a mother. I actually did this interview a few months ago with Michelle. She is a fertility acupuncturist and she is the host of the Wholesome Fertility Podcast. I really connected with Michelle. She is super cool. She has an amazing vibe. She doesn't have a infertility story per se. She kind of became her own hero before she started trying for kids. She realized that she just was super unhealthy and things weren't right. She didn't like what the medical system was doing for her. So she started taking matters into her own hands and then she just loves the whole thing and has embraced it she loves acupuncture she's a hypnotherapist she loves essential oils she is just all about taking control of your health and this is what she did and now she is spreading the word and her love for all the things that you can use to do this for yourself i found um, michelle super straightforward no bs i know the title of this podcast might be a little off-putting it's really not about what you think but these are words out of michelle's mouth and i just loved it right i loved her, her honesty so without further ado let's get to the episode So we are here today on the Infertile Diagnosis with Michelle, and you live in Florida. Florida, yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. And we're both sweating in our rooms right now. We had the ACs cranked and we've turned it off for the podcast. Um, But uh, I wanted to bring Michelle on because she has a very kind of different story. Um, She doesn't really, you don't really have a fertility or infertility journey. You kind of saw a little bit of the light before you trying, um, started trying to conceive. So um, tell us a little bit about that. So I guess I would say that I was saved in, ahead of time because had I not gone and taken care of the imbalances that I had, I probably would be in that situation where I'd have fertility challenges. So ever since I got my period at age 13, I never had a regular like monthly period I would sometimes go like two and a half months and then sometimes it would be four months in between. It was just really, really irregular. So when I was 17, my mom took me to a GYN and I expected to go in there, come out, know exactly what needs to get done. He's going to cure me. He's going to tell me exactly what I need to do because I I didn't know anything about the medical system. (laughs) So I went and I wasn't even sexually active and he gave me the birth control pill as a prescription. He's like, I'm giving you the pill. And I'm like, you're giving me the pill? Like, it just made no sense. (laughs) And I'm like, why are you giving me the pill? And I didn't even know what the pill did except for stop you from getting pregnant. I didn't even know like the whole thing that you're controlling your period, but it's not really a period. I had no idea. Clueless, you know. But one thing I did know is that it just didn't make sense as a solution. So he told me it's going to get you to have your period every month. And I said, well, what happens when I get off? And he goes, you're, gonna, you're not going to have your period regular. So like I said, it just made absolutely no sense. But what can I do? I just took his solution and went on the pill for a couple of years, got off the pill a couple of years. And every time I went on the pill, I felt like I was a little off. I'd get a little more bloated. Um, I just didn't feel 100% myself. And I guess it was kind of like a subtle knowing, like this isn't exactly good for me. And so for years went off and on in my, into my early 20s. And um, finally, I remember going away and backpacking for about four months. And I came back and I didn't get my period once. And, and I, at that point, 
moved back to New York where my mom lived. And I told my mom, this isn't normal. I'm like, this, I, I got to figure something out. And I knew what answers I would get if I was going to go to any doctor. So I, she, she just happened to find out about this doctor, Chinese doctor named Dr. Lee in Queens, New York. And so we went there and the same day I went, I came home with a bag of herbs and I got my period that day. And I got my period again four weeks later and I rescheduled an appointment. This is like after one shot of seeing him. So I rescheduled to see him weekly. I'm like, I got to see this guy all the time. I mean, he's amazing. And I just actually went to New York and visited him. I was so excited. I'm like, you're the reason I'm doing this. You're, you're the reason why, because I was an architect at a completely different path. And I, um, it just changed my, my whole mentality about wellness and life. And, and as soon as I started to feel my own imbalances, I guess, like, or feel better, then I realized how imbalanced I was. My skin cleared up, just things started to change. And not only that, I worked in the city in corporate America as an architect. And I remember at times being more sensitive and affected by things. And, um, and at that point, I started feeling like nothing's affecting me. Like I, things roll off my back. I'm happier. And so that, started this little fire in me to go back to school someday and learn natural medicine because I wasn't really feeling satisfied as an architect with the stress and not dealing with not working with people which I wanted to Um, so that's how it first started but looking back had I not gone to him who knows what I would have been like once I got married and tried to have kids yeah I'm just going to say real quick, you, you kept like, you keep going in and out of your mic. I don't know if the earphones has a mic in it. So if it's picking up, it shouldn't because mine doesn't, but just to let you know that. Okay. Okay. Um, right now, (laughs) where do I go? Um, how old were you when you went to see, um, the acupuncturist? I was 23. Five. 25. 25. 25. So you had about six years being on and off the pill. And were you yeah. kind of your typical normal New Yorker who just ate whatever you wanted? Were you kind of mindful about what you were eating and drinking or Probably not? I mean, it's weird. At times, I guess I thought I was. I, I went to, I moved to San Francisco. I decided to be a vegetarian, but I had no idea what I was doing. I just eat rice and I, I didn't eat proteins like natural. I, I had no idea. And then my mom came to visit me and I was super pale. And she said, you need a steak. <laughs> she like, <laughs> she took me to like Morton's or one of those restaurants. And, and I felt like a plant that was wilting come back to life. I got color in my face. And so I just, um, I think I was kind of in my own ignorance thinking I'm doing something healthy, but not really knowing enough about nutrition. So probably was not, no, I didn't, I didn't really take care of myself. Yeah. And so you were just put on the pill. There was no, and I guess you just saw the acupuncture after there was no kind of diagnosis for you then. Like, do you ever, do you know yeah. why your per- periods were irregular? No, no diagnosis, but was it interesting is even though, um, I got more regular, I did have acne. I wonder if maybe I had PCOS at one point, I'm not sure. Um, and then another thing too, there was a diagnosis, but it was afterwards where I had a pituitary adenoma, but I was already um, regulated by Dr. Lee Mm -hmm. at that point. And I was getting my period every month, but they found that I had um, high prolactin and then um, I got checked and there was a pituitary adenoma. But then over time that all balanced out after years of my just meditating and taking care of myself. and, And then I had checked again years after before I got pregnant and they say they said when they looked at the MRI suspect of something, meaning like it was so small that they can they see something but they don't know what it is. And you know, so obviously it shrunk. So I don't know if it was like my eating, my meditation, my just my lifestyle changes. So that yeah. was like a, a tumor in the brain? Yes, it, it was a my it was a benign uh, pituitary adenoma, it's called and it's in the pituitary. And it causes you to lactate and create breast milk. And then your body believes that you're pregnant and therefore you don't, you don't, um, 
get your period. That's crazy. So I, I do think that that probably had something to do with it. But what was interesting is that they found it after I was already regular. So I'm not really sure <laughs> what he did to make me regular or maybe what he did eventually shrunk it. Or, I'm not sure. Yeah. And after you saw the acupuncturist and you saw what he did for you, um, was he, he gave you herbs, but then did you change up your lifestyle? Were you back kind of eating? Not, uh, not an, uh, no, no. I, I started to be more conscious. Um, I still didn't know a lot about food. I was probably eating, um, a little healthier, you know, a little more aware, but I wasn't like anything crazy, you know, like super, super healthy. Like, but, um, probably a little bit more. I think I became a little more conscious in general and I naturally gravitated towards doing healthy things. Um, but one of the biggest things that happened around that time is I started to also read a book about the subconscious mind and I started to do affirmations and I started to focus on what I was thinking habitually. And if it was a positive, was it not? And I started thinking more positive, consciously changing my mind. I started meditating more. And I would meditate on the train because I lived in Long Island and worked in the city. So I'd meditate on the train and I just brought that into my mind, uh, into my life. And I think that that's huge. I, I'm a true believer that there's many paths to healing. Uh, one of them is food and diet and also herbs or anything that you're taking in. And then another one, which is the fastest way is the mind. Mm -hmm. But the mind has a lot of, there's a lot of, um, I don't want to say blocks, but it, it has a lot of hurdles to get into the subconscious mind because it's, it's our own defense mechanism yeah. to allow super quick changes to happen. It's to protect us really because yeah. we don't want to just make something manifest right away because most of the time our minds are not, are not that pure and aligned with our best <laughs> interests. So I think that if you can somehow through affirmations and meditation opening, align yourself, that's the quickest way to healing. And um, later on, something that's always intriguing me is um, studies that they've done on people with multiple personality disorders. And most of them um, will have different symptoms depending on the personalities. And sometimes labs change. My husband, who's a doctor, actually mentioned this that he learned it, and I think it was in medical school, that one would have diabetes and another would not. And they would check them and test them. That's so, um, yeah, it's, it's just, so to me, you know, how we identify as, as who we are and our, how we identify also with our symptoms, it's huge. It just goes to show, because what's the difference? It's the same exact body but they're, they're different, completely different identifications of personality. Yeah, exactly. And that will change so much, you know? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, I did both. I definitely went the food route first and then got into the mental. And what I found when I started changing my outlook and my thoughts was that doing all the hard work with your food got easier. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I remember the first time sitting down eating, everyone knows if they follow me on Instagram that I eat vegetables for breakfast. And the first time I ever did it, I was pissed off. I hated it. I was so mad at the situation that I had to sit down. And then I started laughing at myself out loud. And I'm like, why are you pissed off? You're eating steak. And at the time it was spinach and an egg. Like, why are you mad at this situation? Um, so yeah, it, I feel like they go hand in hand. I know a lot of people in the infertility world get really annoyed at people who say, well, just be positive, um, you know, change your outlook, do all those things, and they'll magically get you pregnant, which, um, you know, for me, they won't, um, mm -hmm. especially have well, for me, I had a very deep underlying issue. I had to change what I ate, mm -hmm. but changing my outlook made that whole situation that I was going through not as bad as it was. You know, mm -hmm. I, um, I got healthy because of my infertility, you know, who like yourself, who would have known 10 years down the line, if I was going to deal with a major thyroid issue or uh, some other really blown, blown up, um, autoimmune issue. Um, so it is, um, like you say, just, um, or you said in your journey, 
seeing those signs that something isn't right. And for us in the infertility world, if you're not getting pregnant, that's not right. Women were designed to get pregnant. Okay, some of us, you know, are going to have some issues that aren't necessarily going to be overcome with diet, lifestyle, mental, you know, there are those rare cases out there that you have a genetic, you know, disorder that's going to, you know, lead to other things, or if you don't have a uterus, I mean, it's hard to get pregnant without a uterus. You know, if you're, you, if your husband does not have any sperm or has been, his sperm is, his sperm has been affected. But I think for the large majority of us, there are huge benefits of a mental and a physical change um, to help us in our journeys. Absolutely. And I just want to say, like, I always say that it's, it doesn't mean that that's the reason you're not getting pregnant, but it does help. Mm -hmm. It helps the journey. It helps how you feel. It helps it, it helps and it can only help. It can't right. hurt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But when you're starting the journey, it does hurt. You know, I think because like you said, you put up all these defenses, especially when you go into an IVF round, you start um, planning other things if it doesn't work out or you don't get your hopes up too high because you don't want to be crushed. But in reality, um, there's a lot of things we can't control. And mm -hmm. so if you just go into it a little bit more positive, you're going to have control of how you feel during the journey and then whatever the outcome is after the journey. Of course, you're going to be crushed no matter yeah. if, you know, if you don't get pregnant or um, if it's not a viable pregnancy. But I always say you're going to handle it with a little bit more grace. It's not going to be soul destroying. You're not going to be in the darkness for a very long time if you can take control of your mental health before these issues happen. Yeah. And you need you need support. And 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 I'm totally I'm all about surrendering to the pain. It, it, you know, this is part of life. I think when you surrender to the pain, surrender to whatever it is, whatever it is, I think it's even more than that, more than being, oh yeah, everything's great. Cause I don't think that that's natural and I don't think that that's practical. Is, uh, is really more of an allowing and a surrendering saying, okay, here I am. This is what's happening right now. Like, what do I need to do? You know, it's kind of, um, and it's tough. And sometimes like in many people's journeys, like you, had, we had spoken about before in the pre-chat is sometimes your body's telling you something. It's giving you clues. Hey, listen, pay attention to something. And, you know, so it's more of, through years of meditation, this is what I've learned. The best thing to do is just be in a state of receptivity. Just what is it? Listen, you know, and it doesn't mean, oh, everything's great. It's just more of um, an allowance yeah. and allowing. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's hard to get there, you know, and you know, my, um, my advice is just don't give up on it. You know, even if you're a month into it and you still think it's bullshit, just don't give yeah. up. You know, just keep yeah. going because we all get those breakthroughs somewhere at some point. And mm -hmm. if you don't, if you're not into yoga, go for a walk. If you don't like running, you know, find your niche, you know, journaling, meditating, listening to music, dancing. There's so many releases out there. And I think some people just don't connect with a lot of them, but don't, you know, make the connection that it doesn't, you don't have to be sitting on a pillow meditating for 20 minutes to be enlightened. Yeah, for some people, it's like, that's like the worst thing you can ask them yeah. to do. <laughs> you know? um, some people, it's kickboxing, you know, just getting the anger out of their frustration or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so you started to see, let's get back to like your journey. Sorry, we've kind of diverted. Um, you started seeing the acupuncturist and you started seeing some you know, instant changes, right? It was instant for you, which yeah. is amazing. Um, and it sent you on this path of just being more connected with yourself. Um, what other kind of changes you said you made, you started meditating a lot more. You, was there a certain point in time where you felt like a really big change with the diet, nutrition, lifestyle? Um, you left your job, you went back and studied. Yeah. So what happened was it took me a couple of years. Um, I was living in New York and then got married to my husband who uh, was doing his residency. 
So for a couple of years there, I couldn't really make any changes. So I continued working in architecture and at the time felt, um, I guess the more in tune that I became with myself, the more I realized uh, what I was doing that wasn't aligned with who I was. And so it just made me realize like, I really don't want to do this for a living. And so um, I started learning about essential oils and signed up for an Ayurvedic school when we moved to Florida a couple of years later. And that's, that was a start. It was a great start. I learned a lot about essential oils. I started using them and that's when I really learned about food and how trans fats were horrible for you. And um, those were kind of, and, and then all of a sudden it's like, I, I always say it's like I swallowed the red pill. Now I know too much. Cause like every time, everywhere I look, I'm like, Oh, don't do that. Oh, that's horrible for you. You know, um, the cell phones on their head, you know, things like that, that even the companies will admit to are horrible for your body. And so I started realizing um, there's just so such a lack of awareness, I think in general with a lot of people and then the pesticides and organic. So that's where I started to learn all of those things. And it, it kind of took my wellness to a whole other level and my awareness to a whole other level as well. And I started to feel just more energy, you know, where I used to be exhausted. And I think what really took me to another level is after having kids. Um, so I did Ayurveda and then after having kids, I decided to go gluten free. And I must have had a sensitivity to gluten that I was not aware of. But ever since I, I stopped eating gluten, my energy like is way more. I have more energy now than I had before I had kids. Yeah. So it's amazing. <laughs> That's insane. And and it is it is insane how one thing can be a big effect and you don't realize because you just live life right everyone's supposed to be tired it seems like yeah. our society accepts that we're tired all the time yeah exactly and we're not supposed to be that way <laughs> no no I, me I remember um being so tired after lunch at work you know this is before i got balanced and i was like literally would want to fall asleep on my in my desk and like just fight to stay awake and and the worst thing is if they decided to have a meeting a staff meeting i was like no because <laughs> then you're just sitting there in a, a chair and you're just like trying not to nod off but but that's how I'd, I'd be after digesting my food and it just goes to show i mean there's so many so many things happening in my body that i wasn't even aware of and now I, I feel great and I'm like so much older than I was before. So, you know, you talk about youth, but I feel youthful yes. at a later age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And um, I've just lost my train of thought. I lose my train of thought when it gets really hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the heat. So with your acupuncturist, you, 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 got, you got your periods back. And mm -hmm. I guess that was your main goal, right? Yeah. Well, a lot of things. I also wanted to just get balanced. I felt stressed. Yeah. So I got, um, I felt better. I was, I felt more centered. Whereas before I didn't even know where my center was. That's how I felt like a lot of emotions all over the place in my early twenties, not finding myself. And I felt like after going to an acupuncturist and, and getting everything else, kind of everything kind of fell into place. And I felt like I found myself a little bit more. Like I was able to just align with who I was much more um, deeper and in better focus. And, and so that's really what it gave me. And then of course it was like the beginning to a very long journey. So it wasn't like all of a sudden, I mean, there were a lot of a major, major ahas and, and leaps, but it wasn't everything all at once. It started a curiosity within me and I think part of what happens is when you do get balanced, you start to want to get better and you'll start to find what's better for you. And that includes relationships, it includes food, it includes lifestyle, everything. And you'll also accept no less than what you deserve in life. And, and that's when I started to, I decided to do a job that was more in line with who I was. So it was just a bunch of those things for me and it took years and and then eventually, I, when I went to school for Ayurveda, that was like the beginning of learning 
And then I had kids, so I didn't want to bring in people for consultations. So I just was a stay at home mom for a while without anything. I was selling art online. <laughs> that was like my thing, but I wanted to be home. And then years later, once my kids both went to elementary school in the morning, um, I knew they were going to be there. I, w I signed myself up for school to learn acupuncture. And that's when I went back to school. And with your knowledge now, what do you think acupuncture did for you in the beginning months? It um, awakened, I guess, a, a vitality in my body. And it also removed some major blocks. And how did, how, did they, how did that do that? Like for people who don't know anything about acupuncture. It work, basically? Yeah. yeah. Like, so well, basically, it's like we have highways in our bodies. And, and we know some of them we can see, which is our blood vessels and nerves. You know, some of them are, are, we're able to study and some of them we can't see, you know, which are energetic. So we have these energetic highways in our body, which are called meridians. And they all go deep in our bodies. Some of them go through the liver. Some of them go through multiple organs, really, really deep in our body. And they basically bring life force energy, which is called chi. Mm -hmm. And that supplies the body. So we need blood and chi. Those are like, a, and then there's an essence and there's a lot of different ones, but those are the two main things that a lot of times we work on. And so the chi can get blocked if the meridian gets blocked. And what's really cool is that every so often those meridians, those same exact meridians, those same highways that reach the deep parts of our organs also come up to say hello on the surface of our skin. So we'll have like certain ones that come up. And they actually found with some studies that those areas of the meridians have, uh, there's like a, there's um, less skin resistance in those areas. It comes up to the surface. So you're able to put in a tiny hair thin needle. And by doing that, you can actually stimulate the whole meridian. Okay. And each point has specific effects that it can do. So if there's any blockages, and it takes about 28 minutes for that energy to circulate throughout your whole body. So that's why most of the time when people go to acupuncturists, some people do 20 minutes, but 28 minutes is usually what I like to put my timer on so that the person gets the full um, cycle of energy. Yeah. And, and so what that does is by stimulating it, it, it almost like, I mean, you can say it creates an immune response. It basically awakens the body. And it also allows those highways to move more freely. So if you have any blockages, that that will release it I'll over time. Support it. Yeah. So when you when this worked, like the day it happened, like do you remember thinking anything like specific about it, or was it just like, wow, this is amazing? I want to do more research into it. Um. I was never a, re a research person at that. Well, I'd research meaning like I'd go online and just kind of like look into the benefits of it, but I never was like a big science research person just because in my nature, I'm very spiritual. So I, I liked how it made my body feel. And I immediately kind of, I never was afraid of the needles. Yeah. Like sometimes people are afraid. I never had an, I never had that initial, like, Oh my God, it just kind of felt so natural, like as if I've done it before. Yeah. And, and I liked the tingling effect that I felt in my body. And then I remember him doing a point in between my eyebrows. I'm like, oh, that's the third eye. So I had a little bit more, I have a little bit more of a spiritual inclination. I kind of just tend to, you know, be more spiritual. So, um, but I, my research is reading books and things like that. And it wasn't like, um, at the time, like studies, I didn't really know much about them because I was an architect as well. <laughs> so, um, but I would, I would learn a lot about it, um, uh, through books. There was like books on acupressure points and, um, books on natural, like medicine or food and remedies and that kind of thing. So that was my big research on it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I know I didn't ask you this question in um, the notes I gave you. Um, I always try to set up my guests with notes um, just to let everyone know, because sometimes it's like really off catching, isn't it? But uh, well, for me, I went to see a few acupuncturists during my journey. Um, 
I I did I did like it. I wouldn't say that it I connected with anyone, and that's always my top tip for anyone going to see someone holistic, um, is that you need to connect. You need to go there and feel the connection with not only them but the environment and what the treatment is supposed to be doing. I feel like that has a huge play on it helping to work. Um, what would you say to anyone going through infertility? And it doesn't necessarily work. Like for you, your period started, you know, for us who are infertile, um, we go see an acupuncturist, let's say for months, and we're still not pregnant. What would be your advice for them? I would say try somebody else. I mean, because it's it's the same thing as yoga. Like people who decide they don't like yoga, but then they have the wrong teacher and then they find the right teacher. It's like the most amazing thing ever. And um, it, it, there is such a thing as having the wrong person or not that they're wrong, but it's just they're not connected. They're not right for you. Mm-hmm. Just like um, marriage, you know, it's the same kind of thing. It's just a matter of finding a compatibility. And believe it or not, I also feel that sometimes I don't connect with my patients or, and I, I prefer for them to try something else because I know that there's just that they're not able to receive what I'm able to give. And so it happens. It's, it's a thing. So I would say try, and you know what? Acupuncture may not be the solution for you. Not everybody responds just to that. Somebody might respond to a nutritionist and something that's a little bit, it could be anything. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think with all of these holistic things and even diet diet is you have to find what works for you. Um, mm-hmm. I went AI or I went uh, paleo for a whole year and I still didn't get pregnant. Now, most people would think paleo is a very healthy diet and it is, but I had to go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not, um, yeah, like you say, it's not for everyone, but for me, I had to go that extra step. I had to, there was things in the paleo diet that were unhealthy for me. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's a great answer in the sense that, um, if you don't feel like it's working and it's maybe because of the person you're seeing, definitely find someone else. Um, if you, if you enjoy whatever the holistic treatment is, um, do you, well, you kind of answered this in the very beginning, but do, um, addressing your health issues at 25 before you were even thinking about having kids, um, what, what do you think are the bis- biggest effects going into trying to conceive? For acupuncture? Um, just for your journey. Like what, what did you, you know, your acupuncture, you know, you changed up your, you know, mental health, meditation, you were more holistic about what you were eating and a little bit more mindful. Um, you know, did that have, um, do you feel that had a really big effect when it came to trying to see, you know, trying to conceive your children? Yes. And, and it's interesting because I went to India because at the time I was studying Ayurveda, I, I didn't, <clears throat> excuse me, I didn't um, study acupuncture at that point. I just knew Ayurveda. So I wanted to go to India because I wanted to learn a little bit and, and about the culture and also um, get a panchakarma, which is uh, an ancient Indian therapy, which is really, really healing. Let me stop you there. Explain yeah. what Ayurveda is to people because I think oh, oh, I'm sorry. people might not know. Oh, thank you for, for that reminder. <laughs> okay, so Ayurveda is like the cousin of acupuncture. It's, um, it's ancient Indian medicine. And there are a lot of therapies there. They, they really teach a lot about food and body types. So there's three main body types and you can be a mixture of all three or um, two, uh, you know, so like the, the first and second, second and third, or first and third, or, or all three or just one. So everybody has different elements. That's why, that's where the saying um, one man's food is another man's poison we just talked about how paleo diet could affect one person really well and another person not so well. And so that's the reason is that everybody has different elements in their body and Chinese medicine also sees it that way. So they learn um, something called Vata, Pitta and, and Kapha, which is a, are the three main body types. And Yoga was very linked with Ayurveda, although in the U.S. kind of got separated as its own or in the West. 
was taken as its own thing. But Ayurveda and yoga are like two sisters. They're very connected. And the yoga was like the physical therapy. Whereas Ayurveda, um, they talked about food, when to eat certain types of food, how to live, how to breathe and conduct your life and how the mind works in regards to how your body flows. And it's very similar to Chinese medicine, but it's a little different. And they do a lot of um, cleanses, which is, and a lot of massages, which is one of the reasons I didn't really want to go into it because I just didn't want to do massages and it just wasn't something that intrigued me to do. But they do a lot of that, which calms the spirit. And, um, and then there's a lot of enemas cleansing the system and fasting. And so it, when we went to India, I went there. And of course, my husband, who was not really excited about going to India, but he was like, I love you and I'll go for you. <laughs> so we went and, um, and it was definitely very interesting, like a completely different world and a lot of amazing, amazing things and some disturbing things, you know, to see people going through um, a lot of poverty is really, really heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And so it was just a really interesting time. But it, the point is, is that all of a sudden I wasn't thinking to have kids and all of a sudden it was kind of like I was open and I was meditating and I was kind of in this receptive state. And I was like, all of a sudden I was like, I have to get pregnant now. And I wasn't looking for it. It kind of came to me. And it was kind of like aligned, I think. And it was after years of changing my own habits and, and my diet. And I feel like I was like in a good place. And it was as if it just, it kind of called me. And that's it. And I just came home and I, we tried and I got pregnant. And it was just like, I, but it was, I guess the reason I'm saying this is because I think that at that point in my life, I was so receptive to whatever the universe wanted mm -hmm. and it wasn't my will. It was like the universe's will at that point. And so that's huge. I think because I do think part of it, as we spoke in the pre-talk, uh, fertility is so mysterious because you could do everything by the book as far as your body and what you're eating and what you're thinking. And, and if, if it's not meant to be at that moment, it'll be at a, another time. And I'm actually starting to tell a story that's been very personal, but I do think that it's important for people to hear is that years before when we were in New York, before we decided to move to Miami beach, I actually had a chemical pregnancy, which didn't stick. And um, I wasn't looking for it at the time. I wasn't looking to get pregnant and that happened. And I was crying because my husband was still in residency. We we're like in flux and not crying because I didn't want it. It was just crying because I was emotional. It was just like, oh my God, you know, like I wasn't expecting this and oh my God. And I cried, cried, cried. And I went to bed and I saw a girl with long blonde hair sitting on top of a, a washer. And I see the cycle. It's like this. And I, everything in dreams, I feel like is symbolic. And it kind of went like this, like a wheel. And she was sitting on top of it and she said, oh, she was like, hey, I just came to say hi, I'm going to come back. And what's crazy is I have brown hair, as you can see, with brown eyes. And um, my older daughter has brown hair, brown eyes. My, my second daughter had long blonde hair and blue eyes, exactly like in my dream. And to me, it was just, it's no coincidence that I had that dream. It's just to show that that was not the moment. So I woke up after that dream and I had my period. <laughs> it was just crazy. And of course I cried and cried and cried because of that. It was just like the whole thing was very emotional, but I, I remember it now. And I think to myself, Oh my God, like everything is, you know, everything is so out of our hands and it is in our hands and it's out of our hands at the same time. Yeah. And it, it was just, it's very, very fascinating how like we can only control so much. Like, that wasn't the moment. That wasn't the right genetic combination. It wasn't the right alignment at that point. Yeah. And it's really hard to think that way when you're going through infertility, because I think, um, you know, you were, like you said, you're very lucky that you had that intuition to take control of your health before you started to try and, you know, to conceive. 
and um, you were doing these massive steps, even though they probably didn't feel massive for you at the time because you weren't focusing on an end result with the steps. You were just doing the steps because that was what was right for you. Um, and so when those things happen and it, you are mentally in those places, they're just like we've talked about previously, they're just easier to process, mm -hmm. you know, because they're not, they don't, it's not easier, right? It's not like going through anything like that isn't easier. It's just, you can process it in a more clear way. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. it's definitely not. It's definitely not easier. And um, I was going to say something that like totally uh, slipped my mind. But yeah, it's just um, trying to remember again. So it happens to me too. And I'm also right. in a hot room. So maybe. It's the heat. It's the heat. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Definitely. But it's like a very intriguing topic, you know, yeah. because um, there's so many, there's so many hands and there's so many parts to this. Yeah. And it is a mystery. I really do believe in souls. I believe in the alignment of souls and, and that they have to come into the proper genetic code. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't work now. It works later. And like, and I've had, I've had so many conversations with women after the fact, after all of this, you know, like after they've gone through it and they say, Oh my God, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have changed one thing because I wouldn't have had my exact child. Like that came exactly when my child was supposed to come. Like, it's just incredible, you know, right. when you see it that way. And but hindsight is twenty twenty. <laughs> yeah, hindsight's a bitch. Um, I feel the same way. Um, so our last frozen embryo transfer, we had two eggs on ice. We put them both back in, and um, we had the AIP diet. We had um, the um, sorry. It's okay. My uh, phone's doing that too. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, we had the AIP diet, we had the immune suppressing drugs, the embryos looked healthy, they thawed great, I was supposed to have twins, and I miscarried. And, you know, we were devastated. I mean, that really took a blow to us, because obviously the miscarriage, but also it was the end of our very long journey, we had already decided um, no more medical assistance after that. And um, I was pregnant two months later, naturally with our son, and I always look at him and just go, I get why I could oh I just got the chills all over my body. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I understand why those two didn't hang around because you were supposed to be here. And it's, it's just, um, yeah, it's very hard to see those things when they're happening. But um, like we've said before, um, if you get in the right mind frame, you can see in a very positive light why those things do happen. Yes, and I just um, remembered what I was going to talk about. You know, um, the what this one book, the Untethered Soul. Mm -hmm. Have you ever read that? Mm -hmm. um, you know what he says is very interesting. He said that we don't. Nobody wants to feel pain. I think we like as humans, our automatic reaction is to resist any kind of pain or any kind of discomfort. Discomfort, and what that does, unfortunately, is it actually doesn't stop it from coming. Yeah it actually keeps it in place. And so sometimes it's the same thing with like any kind of pain that you have physically, um, just allowing that to move through whatever it is, whether you're feeling cramping. I would feel like that sometimes during having cramps before when I had have my period before um, getting pregnant, they were really, really severe. And I would just like, uh, at times I would be like, okay, let me just try to like allow this. And as soon as I would just like surrender and kind of like not try to stop it, it didn't hurt as much, yeah. which is very weird. But I feel like the same goes for any kind of emotions and any kind of blockages that we hold into our body. Just um, like I said, just kind of melting into the pain and, and allowing it to happen doesn't keep us in this state of discomfort, even though it's it's not comfortable, but sometimes like even having a good cry mm -hmm. feels so liberating. Right. Yeah. You know? <laughs> good scream and a kick. <laughs> yeah. It just feels liberating because you're feeling it. You're allowing it. You're not pushing it away. You're just, you're, you let, you're allowing it to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And like, like we've said before, it's not an easy place to get to, you know, mm -hmm. there, you have to keep training and, doing the hard work to um, 
get there. I know with my journey, you know, I've been doing this for a few years now and I still fall short. I still like will get flared up and I'm like, how the hell did I get here? <laughs> like, all right, let's go back into the training mode and let's go back to the yeah. baby steps of how to not get here. I think it's like, I don't think that it ever stops. I think yeah. it's up until the last breath that you take here on earth. Right. You know, it's just constant. I mean, we all have triggers and we all have different things and, you know, but it's a matter of kind of being inquisitive, like, Hey, what is this? Why, you know, mm -hmm. why am I reacting like this and <laughs> what's happening? you know, and also just the faith that you can handle it. You can yeah. handle it. We're, we're a lot stronger than we think. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, we talk about hindsight being a bitch with everything you have learned and you have been through, uh, what's your one piece of advice for anyone struggling with infertility? Mm -hmm. It's a tough one because, um, I really, it's like, you know, I like advice. I don't like advice because it's just every single person is so different and everybody's going through such different paths. And I just, I guess if, if there's one thing that I would say is just honor yourself, honor yourself where you are, love yourself, you know, love yourself just as you are and just as what you're going through and just honor yourself as an individual and a woman or a man or whoever's listening, you know, like, just honor it. It's part of the sacred journey called life. And, and um, somewhere, somehow, it passes, you know, whether it, you get some kind of resolution, because I've seen so many people on the other end, you know, after everything, and everybody finds a path that eventually aligns with them. Yeah. Whether, and I've seen, I've seen it from people getting pregnant naturally, and I've seen it through people choosing IVF or even egg donors. And I've seen it with adoption. And they're all happy. At the end, they're all happy. They choose to parent however it, it fits them at that point. And they're all happy in the end. So just a matter of honoring yourself and allowing yourself to get through this and forgiving, you know, um, what's, having compassion with yourself. Yeah. No, that's a great piece of advice. Because um, we all need to do that. We tend to take care of other people or, you know, think taking care of ourselves isn't necessarily because maybe we don't feel like we need to, but, mm -hmm. uh, or deserve. And, yeah. and we absolutely deserve it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your journey and your wisdom and your knowledge. Um, I hope um, you have a beautiful day in Miami. I know it's kind of the end for you. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> and um, all of, um, let, let our followers know where they can find you. So my main website is www.thewholesomelotus.com. Um, that'll lead to the website, which is the wholesome lotus fertility.com, but it's just easier to remember. <laughs> and, um, and basically there you can find all my information. Great. And you have a fertility program that you do is online, right? Cause you, you have a practice in Miami, but you do a fertility program online. Correct. I do. And it's, um, it's a series of courses that address, uh, diet, you know, and it's based on actual studies. So now I actually do do my research <laughs> when I look at real studies and all that kind of stuff. So it's based on studies. A lot of what I put on there is based on research. And uh, one of them is the fertility diet, specific foods that help fertility or have been shown to help for fertility. Plus, I also go into the Ayurvedic foods and how to figure out your body types. And in Chinese medicine, I also teach a little bit of how to figure out your own pattern so that you have a little more control on your own imbalances if you're feeling them and what you could do to address that. And I go over acupressure points with essential oil recipes to, um, to help that also mindfulness and some hypnosis because I went back to school to study that as well. So I add that in um, and just going into the power of the mind and and kind of connecting back to the sacred. So that's my fertility program. And I combine that with coaching calls as well. And, um, and then I also have the fertility podcast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's all go over there in Miami. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's the heat. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but thank you very much. And um, yeah, have a wonderful day. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much for having me.
A few more things before you go. If you like what we're doing, please leave a review and or a rating. We would greatly appreciate it and it would totally help us out. Also, if you'd like to connect with either of us, you can find me, Monica, over at mymindfulme.com and you can connect with Sarah over on fabfertile.com. All the links you need to find us on our websites, our social media, any products we talk about, book, special offers, or any guests that we have on, you're going to find all that information in the show notes. So that's it. Thank you once again for being with us here on the Infertile Diagnosis and have a beautiful day.